Father in heaven, what, what other way can we approach your word than in silent preparation? Lord, uh, as distractions cease, as we focus our minds and attention, our hearts on you and on uh, your word, God, we very quickly are reminded and humbled at how unworthy we are to have a God who has shown your love to us and grace to us and mercy to us in so many ways, one of the greatest ways being the word that you have given to us in Scripture, that we can know who you are, that we can know the realities of the, the sinful depths of our hearts, and that we can know of the only way of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for desiring to be known. And so, Lord, we ask that even now our hearts would be submitted to your word, that we will put ourselves under your word, and every moment that we fight to put ourselves over your word and try to get out from, from the weight of truth, Lord, that we would put that sinful thought to death and that we would trust that you are a sovereign and good God, and that your ways are precious, that your ways are best, knowing that that which brings you most, most glory is also for our good. And so, Lord, we ask that we would have a crystal clear uh, understanding of that this morning. And Lord, we also ask that your word would bring us the joy and the peace and the hope that you have promised. God, that as we uh, hear even of this next uh, from this next uh, prophet in your word, Lord, that you would um, use it to, to convict and even encourage us in our toward uh, walks of godliness before you. God, I ask that you would help me to preach clearly and boldly and be out of the way of the text this morning, and that you would do what only your spirit can do, take any words that are said from the mind to the heart and cause us to live differently. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Oh, uh, good morning again. Go ahead and open up uh, your Bibles to Hosea. To Hosea. Just in case you were wondering when I prayed, when I said that we were going to be hearing from a prophet, I was not talking about me. I was talking about an actual prophet, Hosea, found in the Bible here. I'll give you a moment to find that. As you uh, turn to Hosea, you can just go to the beginning of the book there. Um, I want you to think about the relationship that God has with his people. Uh, and when we talk about the people of God, we are talking about, yes, you and I who are here this morning, anyone whose faith is in Jesus Christ, anyone who is resting in the work of Christ and has been given a new heart, that has been given a new life, uh, and been brought into the family of God, adopted into the family of God. Yes, we are talking about uh, the, the, the church and those people, but specifically... Maybe even narrowing it down a little bit more. When, when we think about the relationship that God has had with his people Israel, and the, the very nation that we've been following over the course of, of a number of, of weeks and months now, and even the reality that the eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing God, creator of all things, that he has been so intimately engaged with his people with a set-apart group of created mankind. Uh, we've talked a lot about Israel. We've talked a lot about, about this, this group of people. And, uh, and it could, we could get the wrong understanding and think, wow, this must have been such a special group of people that God would carve them out of all of humanity, that God would look at them and do all of this with them, and that he would allow his redemptive plan to come through these people. And yet, as you know, we would be gravely mistaken, wouldn't we? Uh, we would be gravely mistaken to think that all of this study has had to do with the nation of Israel, 
Well, really, is it has had everything to do with God. It's had it's had everything to do with the Creator of humanity, not humanity itself. But throughout the Scriptures, there are various analogies that are used to describe God and His people. Do you think of the analogy of father and children? By the way, Happy Father's Day to all you men who are here. You think about the relationship between a father and his children. You think about the analogy of, of the a shepherd and sheep. You think about the Lord and a uh, Lord and his servants. You think about a, a husband and a loving bride. These are just, even just to name a few, these are a handful of analogies that you find throughout Scripture of the God of the universe, his relationship with his creation, and then specifically with his people. This picture of a groom and a groom's bride is used positively in the New Testament. Uh, you, you think about Ephesians chapter 5, whereas Paul is giving the call to, uh, to men to, love their, to uh, love their wives as Christ has loved the church. You think about that, that beautiful picture that a marriage should be between uh, a man and his wife, and that selfless love and leadership that he is to have, that he's called to in Scripture. And then even the command to the bride, the command to the wife to, to love and respect and submit to this man that God has given to this bride as a husband. And when all of that is going well, when, when sin is not ruling the day in a marriage, you see the beautiful picture of this working out. But, also in scripture, you see this picture of a marriage of a husband and a bride used negatively between the, uh, of the relationship between God and his people. The picture of a faithful husband and an adulterous bride, an unfaithful wife. This, this is the picture that God uses to illustrate his relationship with Israel through his prophet Hosea. To show his faithfulness to Israel despite their adulterous unfaithfulness. And so as we're continuing our study through our study of God's communication to his people in the midst and in the times of these divided kingdoms, remember we have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. We looked last week at God speaking to his people through the prophet Amos, and this morning we're going to look at God's message to the northern kingdom of Israel through Hosea. Hosea is different than Amos. Uh, in Hosea, this, this whole book, this whole message that God has given to, uh, to Hosea for the northern kingdom of Israel, it's solely wrapped around Israel's unfaithfulness to their God. And in the midst of this unfaithfulness to their God, continually seeing God's unwavering faithfulness to his people. So let's go ahead and read a few of the first verses of this book, Hosea, starting at chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Those names should be very familiar to you at this point. Verse 2, that when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of Hordom, and have children of Hordom. For the land commits great Hordom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him, a son. What's the picture here that's being painted? This man, Hosea, is called to walk a very difficult path for God to make a monumental point. Hosea would live as a reflection of God's faithfulness. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting. We, we often, hopefully, are praying that we would be faithful before the Lord. We often are praying that, we would, that our lives would be a reflection of faithfulness as we walk 
and follow the Lord. And maybe we may, maybe we may uh, think of different ways that that may bring about persecution in our lives. We may think of different uh, negative and difficult things that that would bring into our lives as we strive to walk faithfully before the Lord. And yet God is telling Hosea, you're going to take this adulterous wife, this wife of whoredom, this wife of prostitution, and in your faithfulness in your marriage, this is going to be a reflection of the faithfulness of the God of Israel toward his people. And sadly, Gomer, his wife, would live as a reflection of Israel's unfaithfulness. Specifically, even being chosen out of prostitution. This is one of those books that we look at and uh, we, we may even be puzzled of, of why is it, how is it that God would use such a uh, horrific and, and difficult and, and painful set of circumstances to, bring a, to, to show a picture of his faithfulness. And yet, as we're going to see, there there's, is no other way that we would even in a tangible way see just how wickedly the people of Israel have lived before their God. So how is Hosea commanded to respond to Gomer's immorality and unfaithfulness? Well, maybe that's not even the best way to ask it. You see, throughout this book, throughout this, uh, this, uh, this uh, recording of this prophecy through Hosea and God's communicating to Israel through Hosea, uh, what you will see time and time again is that it's not even really focused on Hosea. It's not even really focused on Gomer. Time and time again, the question is, how will God respond to Israel's immorality? To Israel's unfaithfulness. Oh, look at chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give, I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in the days, declares the Lord, you will call, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from your mouth, from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. And in that day, I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel, and I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. You see how God will remain faithful to his promise to his people. If you go back, and intentionally we're going to bounce around a little bit, I want you to go back now to chapter 1. Uh, you see those names there, no mercy. You see those names there, not my people. Well, look back at verse 4 of chapter 1. And the Lord said to him, Call his name, Jezreel, this is talking of the son that, that would be born, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Verse 6, she conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name no mercy, for I will, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah 
and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. You can see very clearly what is happening here. As Hosea has taken a wife of prostitution and is now bearing, and now she is bearing these children for Hosea, God is making it very clear that, that the names that these children would have would be a reflection and a sign of the destitute state of the people of Israel. And yet, as we already read at the end of chapter 2, God still will remain faithful. He will be merciful and compassionate. And even in, if you look at verse 10 and 11 of chapter 1, I want you to notice how even in this prophecy, there is a joining of Israel and Judah, a rejoining, you could say. Verse 10 of chapter 1, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in that place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. And then notice verse 11, And keep all the history that we've been studying in mind. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together. And they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. And you can imagine being uh, someone in the, amongst the people of Israel and reading words like that and realizing God is going to bring his people back together. And he's not concerned about maintaining uh, two separate kingdoms. He's not concerned about maintaining a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah. But God, when it is all said and done, will gather all of his people back together. And his promises will be fulfilled in the joining of those people. And this picture really continues multiple times throughout Hosea of an unfaithful wife, and then in turn the faithfulness of Hosea, chapter 3, verse 1. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is, who is loved by another man and, and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes and raisins, cakes of raisins, excuse me. So I, I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Verse 5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord, to his goodness in the latter days. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. And then notice how important the specifics are that are being laid out here. Israel was living objectively wicked. It's not like you can look at, and I know I've mentioned this before, but it's not like you can look at the way Israel was living and say, wow, God is, uh, he's really being a little bit harsh here. He's being a little bit too strict here. No, they are living objectively wicked. You think about the commands that God gave even his people Israel after they were freed from the land of Egypt. And how they were to, to live uh, as a holy people because a holy God was now dwelling among them at that point in the tabernacle. And this list that, that's listed here in verses 1 and 2 so clearly uh, is an affront and flies against the very good 
and beautiful commands of God. It's a needed reminder for us that God's moral standards are for our good. Let that sink in. Think about your sin. I can think about my sin and think about even in its most infantile version of it. We know that it's not good for us. And then, and then think about it as a path, that, that you may be at the very beginning of that path, but if you follow that path to all the way to its end, it's exactly what the Bible tells us. The wages of sin is death. Sin, when, when uh, fully grown, brings forth death, even as James writes. We know that it's not good. God's moral standards are good. If you were to ask anyone in this room to paint uh, or, or list out uh, or write about a society that would truly be a society that they would want to live in. It is a guarantee that you would want a society that is showing love to each other, that, that is faithful, that is uh, even uh, using language that is honorable, where people are honest, where people are not murdering each other or stealing from each other. When people are in a committed relationship, that they are faithful to each other. Or there's not bloodshed. And yet all of those things were turned away from in the land of Israel. Let me just remind you that any moral standard that we try to create, apart from God's, always ends in harm and detriment, not just to ourselves, but also to others. Modern day displays of immorality are no different. Uh, there, there was a book that came out a few years back, and there were some helpful things in this book. I'm not going to name the book itself or the author, but um, in this book, the, the, the author, one of the points that they were making that I, my card's out right, right at the very beginning here, uh, that I completely disagree with, is that there is a certain subset of there's a certain subset of people that live in community with each other, and the community that they have, and this author would agree, it is based on a, a sinful way of life, but even still, there are things that we can gain from how they care for each other and what the community looks like. I couldn't disagree with that more. We need, to, we need to look at life around us through the lens of God's moral standard. And so if we're looking at the world and saying, well, that group of people over there, they seem to be pretty selfless. That group of people over there, they seem to be caring for each other. Yeah, I know that there's sin in their midst, but still we can learn from them. No, we need to remember that the end of all sin is not love toward each other. It's not. It is driven by selfishness. Destruction will bring about nothing good. And so when we think about the church and how we're to operate, we think about our homes and how we're to operate. We think about our workplaces, how we're to operate. We think about our friendships. We think about our parenting. We think about any aspect of life, sports that we're into, recreation, whatever it would be. If we look at the world and say, well, it works for them to operate in that arena that way, so let me just jump in and set God's moral standards aside. Then remember, there's nothing good that will come of that. There's nothing good that will come of that. And Israel was no different. Israel saw that, uh, saw the over, and when we've been studying this, they saw over year after year, decade after decade, even after a handful of centuries, the end of their sin brought them to the point of even sacrificing their own children to these other gods. It's a needed reminder that God's moral standards are for our good. And as this picture continues through Hosea, this even includes hypocrisy among God's people. Go and look at chapter 6, verse 4. <coughs> chapter 6, verse 4. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. 
Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And my judgment goes forth as the light. And notice verse 6. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. That should sound familiar to you. Go and turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, as you can see in the uh, later added subheading there, says, So the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So David is at his lowest low. David has committed a sin that, that quite frankly, if, if, if that happened in our midst, we would, uh, we would not respond in a very gracious way. We would not be just kind of sitting back hoping for humility. David is brought to his knees before God. And notice what it is that he says in verse 16. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. God's standard, well, what God prioritizes, it hasn't changed. It never changes. It truly never changes. God has always demanded humility from his people. You see, the moment that you look at your sin and say, uh, well, God, there's grace, right? So I know that you forgive me and, and we're flippant with our sin and are broken of our sin, the, the moment that we look at our sin in our lives and see I'm not living right for the Lord there, and instead of responding in humility and brokenness, we say, well, well, let me just do more ministry. Let me just add on these other things. Let me read my Bible more. Let me pray more. Let me go to church more. Let me, do, let me uh, uh, change how I'm speaking and change my language. The moment that we start to rely on any of those things, we're not broken before the Lord over our sin. We have completely missed what God says is important. Notice the language. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. You can follow the visual of that, that instead of bringing a lamb or, or a goat to sacrifice to God, instead we are dragging ourselves, we are crawling to the presence of God with our humble, broken hearts and, 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 and perspective on our sin. And we plead for mercy, knowing that there is nothing that we can lay on the altar before God that would solve, that would atone for, that would, that would be enough of a sacrifice for our sin against him. David knew that. That's the only reason why he could be dubbed a man after God's own heart, because of his humility before the Lord. And it's the very thing that God is communicating to his people, Israel, through Hosea. That's how we're to live, with humility before God. Israel's sin is another in a long line of mankind breaking covenants with God. Look at Hosea chapter 6, starting at verse 7. I'll give you a second to get back there. Hosea chapter 6, starting at verse 7. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. They, there they do, dealt faithlessly with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers, tracked with blood. As robbers lie in wait for a man, so the priests band together. They murder on the way to Shechem. They commit villainy in the house of Israel. I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. I, I love when, when you have in Scripture an appeal all the way back to Adam or to Eve. Why? Because it reminds me and it reminds us of, of the, the 
the continuity of God's relationship with mankind and how often, time and time again, we fall short. But then it also reminds me that God's mercy and his compassion and his grace and his love have not changed. Not, not from the times of Israel, not from the times of Abraham, not from the times of Noah, but from the time of Adam and Eve. From, 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 from creation itself at the very beginning, God made promises. Humanity has fallen short of those promises of being faithful to God. And yet God continues to show patience and love and grace and mercy. And yet not only is God's faithfulness akin to that of a faithful husband, but it's also akin to a concerned and burdened and loving father. Look at chapter 11 of Hosea, verse 1. Notice the burden and concern that's mentioned here in the first seven verses. Chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who, thought Ephraim, who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. And yet even in the midst of this burden, and concern, look at the love and compassion that God would have as a loving father. Verse 8, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in my wrath. That is a loving God. That is a loving Father to his children. It always amazes me when I think about some of the responses of the prophets, even specifically thinking of Jonah, that he was so bothered he, he was torn up inside because of God's patience and compassion on Nineveh. And yet we look at these words to the people of Israel, and it's the same character of God. It's the same loving and compassionate God toward a people who are living wickedly. God's desire for his people has always been their good. And yet he knows that apart from his ways, mankind is capable of only one thing, and that is selfish destruction. That's the closing words of this prophetic book, Hosea chapter 14, verse 9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. That call that Hosea ends with, when we read through those, that verse there, whoever's wise, let, under, let him understand these things, discerning, let him know them. The ways of the Lord are right, the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Well, we should read that, and it should be a crystal clear connection. It should be obvious that that call doesn't change to us today. 
some of us need to remember, especially in a day and age where people are calling themselves, uh, are claiming to, to have a gift of discernment and have these so-called discernment ministries. Let me just remind each and every one of us that wisdom and discernment, that they are linked to understanding and obedience. Wisdom and discernment are always going to be linked to understanding and obedience. And all of the above should be the, the desire of all of God's people. See, uh, someone cannot excuse their sin. Someone cannot, cannot claim to be, to be uh, uh, discerning and to be wise and yet be walking in unrepentant sin. That, that's not what the Bible says. That's not the picture that the Bible paints. The, the desire of the believer, the desire of the people of God should be to grow in our understanding and knowledge of God to the end of obedience, not to the end of having a, a lofty theological conversation, but to the end of obedience and love and passion for God. You think of Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Even think of Psalm 119. Even uh, really all throughout Psalm 119, but for the sake of time I won't read all of it. But Psalm 119, starting at verse 1, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. I even think about how many young people we have here in our church. Children of all ages, youth of different ages. Let me just encourage you with this, that, that if, if in any way, shape, or form, you're, you're wondering, do, do I really love God? If in any way, shape, or form, you have any kind of even inkling of a desire for the things of the Lord, it's gonna, one of the, the clearest displays of that is going to be, well, what do you think about his, his word? What do you think about his laws and his statutes? Is there any desire in your heart whatsoever to know what it is that God has revealed to, to you, to his people through his word, to learn it and then to live according to it? That's going to be one of the marks of a heart that is submitting to the Lord. You even think of what the psalmist in Psalm 119 says uh, in verse 9, the very next verse, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Such precious truth there that helps people of all ages, boys, girls, men, women of all ages, to know where the heart should be, where the desires should be. Seems like a strange emphasis. Love, cherish, and then to love and cherish laws, statutes, commands. And yet the reason why language like that can be used is not because of what those commands are, but because of who those commands come from. Because they come from a holy, good God. And this is why there's really no tension or a fight between obedience and grace. See, the law was used to expose the reality that we could never obey enough because of how dead we are in our sins, because of how dead we are without redemption through Christ. You think about what Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So the law was used to expose that reality, but 
Grace is used to reveal this reality that God has given us life through Christ's perfect obedience, opening our hearts to desire obedience to him. This is obedience that, and some of us need to hear this this morning, this is obedience that will not be accredited to your account. Stop and think about that. When you obey the word, you're not making a deposit to your account before God. We can think that, yeah, it's Christ. You think about a bank account. Yeah, I have this kind of like uh, this safety fund already. But when I obey, I'm adding a little bit more. No, you're not. You're not adding an ounce. You're not adding a penny. Not at all. Why? Why? Because... All of it has already been paid. The debt has already been paid. Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now you can think about it this way. Maybe here's a good way to think about it. I'm sure all of us at some way, shape, or form have had some loan or some kind of debt that we have been paying off. Imagine that debt being completely paid off. You have a zero balance sheet in front of you. And then the next time you get paid, you say, you know what? I'm going to send 10 bucks toward that loan. You know what? I'm going to, just in case, I'm going to send a, a hundred bucks toward that car payment that I know, to this car that I know is already paid off. That would make no sense, would it? That would be a complete, uh, a complete, complete wrong thinking. So you may hear all that and think, oh, okay, all right, I like this. I'm getting freedom to just live how I want then. And if, if obedience is not accredited to my account anyway, I could just, I could just sin. I could just live however I want. No, see, obedience won't be accredited to your account because the debt isn't paid, but obedience is a byproduct of faith. Obedience is going to be a sign and a reflection that that debt has been paid. And it's going to be clear that you are not attempting to earn righteousness at all whatsoever. But in response to the fact that your debt has been paid, in response to the fact that now you have been adopted into the family of God, in response to the fact that you can rest assured that, uh, in the hope of eternal life and have seen the love of God on display through the cross, in response to that, you will have no other option, you will have no other desire than to want to obey God in your life. The same way that a fruit, that, that a tree when planted and nourished and is drawing from the nutrients of the soil underneath will grow good fruit. The life of a believer will have fruit that grows, fruit of the Spirit, fruit of good works, of obedience before God. And so brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, remember, no, we're not adding a single ounce to, uh, to, to, to our account before God. But if you're saying that you love God, then you will not love the things of the world. If you're saying that you love God and want to live for Him, then when sin is present in your life, you're going to want to do everything in your power to put that to death. You're going to want to do everything in your power to run away from it. And when you are running and you stumble and you fall and you turn back to that sin, you will be reminded, this is not about works of the law. This is not about trying to earn my salvation. God has forgiven me. And you'll cling to the cross. You will repent and turn away from that sin and back toward the very righteousness that was granted to you because of Christ. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, puts it this way, as Paul is writing here, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. 
Paul goes on to say here, For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Then notice what he says here in verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, you may know how this ends, then Christ died for no purpose. Strong words by Paul. But this is the gospel. This is what has saved you. If you read those words or hear those words, and you know you are not saved from the wrath of God, if you know that you are still in your sin, if you are living according to your own ways, if you are living a life that, that only worships yourself and not God, if you are living steeped in sin and are either fine with that or being crushed under the weight of that guilt, recognize your sin before a holy God and recognize that you can do absolutely nothing to appease Him. And then look to the one who can. Jesus Christ. And you could even say, look to the one who did. Jesus Christ. The perfect one who died on a cross. His blood being shed. His body being broken for all who would believe in him. That is the call of the gospel. For all who would rest in him. And we can speak of him as one who is alive because he rose from the dead three days later to show his perfection, to show that he was vindicated by the Spirit. I mentioned that all sin ultimately leads to death, and that is why we even die in the first place. And yet Jesus, being perfect, see, death couldn't hold him. And so he was resurrected, risen, to the right hand of the Father. And when we even think about his resurrection, uh, don't stop there. Do the same thing that the Bible does. Think about your own future resurrection in Christ for those who are hoping in him. For those of us who are already resting in the grace of our Lord, let us remember that we are forgiven and yet we are still warned not to walk as an adulterous people in our sin. We think about the language of Hosea and the, the picture that's painted there of an adulterous wife before a husband, of an adulterous people before their God. And we may think, wow, that's really strong. That's really strong Old Testament language. I'm, God, I'm, I'm glad God doesn't think like that anymore. James chapter 4, verse 4. Actually starting at verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Verse 4, what is it that James says next? You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose? That scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. And that is a, a stern indictment that isn't just to be heeded by, or wasn't just to be heeded by the nation of Israel. But it's to be heeded by all. In short, if we are living the same as the world around us, then we're living no differently than Israel in the depths of their sin. Israel compared to an unfaithful wife at that point in time of history. So simply, believers rest in God's abundant grace while striving to live in humble obedience. That was the charge to Israel as they stood before God's pending judgments. As they were compared to an adulterous wife, that was the charge to them. And brothers and, sister and sisters in Christ, that is the charge to us today. 
Let's pray. God, the, the, the words that you communicated through your prophet Hosea are weighty words. It's not, it's not a, a picture, it's not an analogy that anyone uh, would want to be uh, descriptive of them. It shows and exposes the depths of sin and immorality, and wickedness, and idolatry. And over time we have seen, even as we have studied how that was born, how that was born out uh, in Israel's history, and even uh, how you will still fulfill your promises to them. And yet, Lord, we ask that we would not read this, that we would not study any of this, disconnected from it, uh, thinking of their sin and not thinking of our own, thinking of their immorality and not thinking of our own, thinking of their idolatry and not thinking of our own. And God, we don't say this as a people who have been called to, to walk uh, with our heads down or, or punishing ourselves for this sin. Or, but we are to be a people who, are conf uh, who confess our sin, who acknowledge and agree with you on our sin and turn from it. And when we do that, Lord, when we are humble before you, we are able to truly rest in your grace, in your love, and truly be able to live out what your word even says, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so Lord, when we view our sin, if we are uh, driven to think that we are condemned before you, God, uh, protect our minds from going to a place that removes the work of the cross. Protect our minds from going to a place that, that, that truly reveals that at times we think we are good enough. We think we have earned salvation before you. And so when we mess up, we think that we lose it. Yeah, Lord, none of us have earned it. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. And through his once, one and, and, and only and final payment for our sin, we are forgiven. So we can walk as those who are free from sin. We can walk as those who are free from the, the weight and guilt of sin and condemnation and walk as those who are striving to live obediently before you, who are striving to, to live in a way that shows that we uh, acknowledge and, 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 and recognize and are grateful for your love toward us and in turn walking as those who love you. God, we ask that this would not only be in how we live, but even in the words that we would proclaim as we proclaim the good news of salvation in Christ to all who are still living dead in their sin. Lord, help them to see that they can be saved. Even anyone in this room this morning, anyone even in the quietness of their own hearts that, that acknowledge and recognize that they are still under uh, the, the weight of their sin, that they are still uh, in the sights of your wrath because of their sin. Lord, help them to plead for your mercy. Help them to, to see that if they place their faith in Christ, if they, if they call out to you, Lord, that they will be saved and they can walk even today as those who are no longer under the, the burden of, and guilt of your coming, of your coming judgment and, and their sin before you. To walk free with peace and joy for the first time. We ask that you would do that even today. God, we ask that you would be honored with the rest of our day today, that you would allow us to think about these things, that you would allow any fellowship and time that we have even with one another to be reflective of a saved people, of a forgiven people, because you have shown your love, mercy, and compassion toward us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let me invite the music team forward, and we will...